Chapter 9, the Sassanid Empire and the Rise of Islam, 200 to 1200. Look at an overview of the chapter here. And our topics are the Sassanid Empire, 224 to 651, the origins of Islam, rise and fall of the Caliphate, you might hear it pronounced Caliphate, 632-1258, and the Islamic civilization. Uh, okay, so the first section in the chapter, how did the Sassanid Empire evolve under the influence of East-West trade? Uh, so the Sassanid Empire, very important uh, empire and the kind of the precursor to the rise of Islam. Uh, so the Sassanid Empire was where the Persian Empire had been, was somewhat of an extension of it. So here you see, of course, the, the Mediterranean, the Byzantine, and, and so on. Uh, but here's the Sassanid Empire, or formerly Persia. Uh, so who were the Sassanids? Iranian Empire, established around 224 with a capital in, in Tesaphon, Mesopotamia. The Sassanid emperors established Zoroastrianism as the state religion. Islamic Arab armies overthrew the empire around 651. Okay, so we talked about Zoroastrianism as also being kind of the precursor to the, uh, to the rise of Islam. Uh, the Sassanids came to power uh, when they defeated the Parthians in ancient Iran and Iraq. And they somewhat restored the old Persian Empire. They saw themselves as the successors of the Achaemenid Persians. Uh, they immediately went into, into a competition with Rome or the Byzantines, as their Eastern Empire was known. We saw that in the map uh, over access to the Silk Road. So, you know, again, it's all about access to trade. Uh, but despite their conflicts, both empires flourished in this in this era, and there was a revival of Iranian nationalism under the Sassanids, okay? Uh, they made Zoroastrianism the state religion. We spoke about this before, just to refresh our memories. What is Zoroastrianism? A religion origin, originating in ancient Iran that became the official re religion of the Achaemenids. It's centered on a single benevolent deity, uh, Ahura Mazda, who engaged in a struggle with demonic forces before prevailing and restoring a pristine world. It emphasized truth-telling, purity, and a reverence for nature. So Zoroastrianism is, is the Zoro, I'll get it. Zoroastrianism is the ancient pre-Islamic religion of Persia, and it contained both monotheistic and dualistic features. Uh, although a fairly small religion today, numbering about only 200,000 people worldwide. Uh, it shares many central concepts with the major world religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Mm -hmm. But at various times, followers of other faiths suffered official persecution. The Sassanid government was centralized. Uh, provincial officials were, were directly responsible to the throne. Uh, roads, city building, and even agriculture was financed by the government under this under the uh, Sassanid Iranian art, I'm sorry, under the Sassanids, Iranian art experienced a general renaissance. Architecture was lavish and magnificent, such as the palace at Tesaphon. Uh, this picture was taken in 1864. So, of course, much, much uh, later after they were actually there, it's ruins. But th this, this picture is, you know, what is that, 100 and so, almost 200 years old, 160 years old or so. Um, relics of uh, Sassanid art include rock, rock sculptures carved at uh, uh, Bishapur, Bishapur. Uh, also metalwork and gem engraving became very popular and sophisticated. Uh, scholarship or learning was encouraged by the state. Works from both the East and West were translated into Pahlavi, the language of the Sassanids. Religious toleration seemed to be something that came and went with them. Christianity, as well as others, were sometimes tolerated, sometimes persecuted. There was religious conflict in general, and this spread up and down the Silk Road, depending on the religious climate. The, the key to all of this is the stage is being set for the emergence of Islam, the third of the three most popular religions in the world today, 
which are Christianity, Islam, Hindu, in that order, Hinduism. Uh, this new religion was born from the ideas of both the Byzantines, the Romans, and the Sassanids. So interesting that Islam, uh, uh, its uh, beginnings actually had something to do with Rome. So next section, the origins of Islam. How did the traditions and religious views of pre-Islamic peoples become integrated into the culture shaped by Islam? <clears throat> So, of course, the rise of Islam is an important, uh, you know, uh, moment in, in world history without question. Uh, you know, like, like I said, a very popular religion today it starts right here, uh, later than Judaism and Christianity. Interesting. Uh, so according to your book, what is Islam? It's the religion expounded by the prophet Muhammad on the basis of his reception of divine revelations which were collected after his death into the Quran. In the tradition of Judaism and Christianity, and sharing much of their lore, Islam calls on all people to recognize one creator God, Allah, who rewards or punishes believers after death according on how they live their lives. So sharing much of their lore, like I said before, Judaism, Christianity, Islam have more in common than they have uh, that's different uh, religion rose from the peoples of the caravans, this religion rose. Uh, so I told you, everything came from an association with trade. You know, the, the trade, sharing ideas, ideologies, points of view, and out of that rose the religion of Islam. And it really started with the pastoralists and nomads that traveled the Silk Road. Let's go ahead and watch a film here. Watch the film entitled Islam, the Quran, and the Five Pillars. Uh, and go ahead and uh, watch that and, come, and then come on back. Okay, let's do a supplemental lecture right here and we'll call this Islam. And here is our uh, outline. Number one, introduction, second largest religion in the world, Prophet Muhammad. Number two, Muhammad. Uh, and tell me about what happens in Mecca, Medina, what is a Hitra, and what is Uma. I'm, I'm writing these out phonetically for, for those of you that can't pronounce these. Number three, conquers Mecca, Abu Bakr, the Quran, conflicts, Sunnis versus Shiites, uh, uh, the, the Umayyad uh, Caliphate. Uh, number five, uh, Islam today, the five pillars, faith, prayer, fasting, pilgrimage to Mecca, and alms, charities, uh, pilgrimage, uh, the Hajj, Kaaba, and, and as, as always, lastly, we have the relevance, okay? So what, what is Islam? Uh, so like I already said, it's the second largest religion in the world after Christianity. Over one billion followers. It is a monotheistic faith, belief in one God. Uh, it is based on the revelations received by the prophet Muhammad in 7th century Saudi Arabia. The Arabic word Islam means submission, uh, reflecting the faith's central tenet of submitting to the will of God. Followers of Islam are called Muslims. What is a Muslim? An adherent or follower of the Islamic religion. A person who submits. So in Arabic again, Islam means submission to the will of God. According to Islamic tradition, the angel Gabriel appeared to the prophet over the course of 20 years, uh, revealing to him many messages from God. Uh, Muslims recognized some earlier Judeo-Christian prophets, including Moses and Jesus, as messenger of the same true God. So again, there's that connection. Uh, peace be upon them. Three men, but one mission. Uh, these three religions have a lot of, you know, potentially anyway, conflict and, and issues today. But the truth is they were all born from the same place. Um, in Islam, however, Muhammad is the last and greatest of the prophets. His revelations alone are considered to be pure and uncorrupted. So the prophet Muhammad dedicated the remainder of his life to spreading a message of monotheism, one God, in a polytheistic, multiple gods world. So there are two important cities uh, involved in this story, uh, Mecca and Medina. So looking at Mecca first, 
This is a city in Western Arabia, the birthplace of the Prophet Muhammad and the ritual center of the Islamic religion. What about Medina? A city in Western Arabia also to which the Prophet Muhammad and his followers immigrated to in 622 to escape persecution in Mecca. Uh, so in 622, he fled north from the place of his birth, Mecca, to the city of Medina to escape growing persecution. Uh, this event marks the beginning of the Islamic calendar, and it is known as the Hitra. Uh, Meccans violently attacked Muhammad and his followers after several years of attacks. Muhammad, <coughs> excuse me, Muhammad and his followers fled Mecca and went to Medina. This migration is known as the Hitra. So again, back to the calendar. Much like the Christian calendar starts with the birth of Jesus, the Islamic calendar begins with Muhammad's fleeing to Medina, uh, known as the Hitra. While in Medina, he was accepted and protected by the Medinians, and they saw him as a divine leader, someone who demanded their respect. It was at this point that the story um, of the story that the Ummah was formed. So what is the Ummah? One Ummah. Ummah means nation, people, generation, community. Okay, um, according to your book, Uma is the community of all Muslims worldwide, a major innovation against the background of 7th century Arabia, where traditionally kinship rather than faith had determined membership in a community. So understand what they're saying. If, if you are an adherent of Islam and you consider yourself a Muslim, it doesn't matter what your what your uh, kinship is or where you're from, if you're a Muslim, you're a Muslim, and, and that connects them worldwide in this community called Ummah, the worldwide community of Muslims. Uh, so Ummah is a common Arabic word meaning people group or nation. Uh, it, has, it has a religious connotation. It has religious connotations in the Quran. God is said to have sent to each Ummah its own messenger, and the messenger, the messengers, Get, were given special prominence as recipients of scripture and founders of an Ummah. And these are Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Uh, Jews are an Ummah based on the Torah, which God gave to Moses. Christians, an Ummah based on the gospel, which God gave to Jesus. And Muslims, an Ummah based on the Quran, which God sent down to Muhammad. <clears throat> So after eight years, Muhammad returned to Mecca uh, with an army and conquered the city for Islam. Uh, his, his influence spread rapidly uh, and you know, his, Islam was firmly uh, in place. Uh, by Muhammad's death, 50 years later in 632, the entire Arabian Peninsula had come under Muslim control. So when they came back, when he came back to Mecca, it, you know, he attacks it, it, and this is called a jihad. We'll talk more about that later. But understand right away, jihad doesn't always mean an attack or, an, or a war. It, it has a different meaning than, than just warfare or attack. Uh, after defeating, he converts Mecca to Islam, and he destroys pagan sites, uh, replace them with mosques, okay? Uh, the, the, the Kaaba preserved an honor report to Mecca, and Mecca is approved as as a pilgrimage site. Okay. Um, after his death, 632, uh, Muhammad's friend and father-in-law, Abu Bakr, became his successor or the caliph. So we heard the word caliphate or caliphate. The, the caliph is the person that is in charge of that of that of that caliphate. Uh, Abu Bakr was considered the def <clears throat> the defender of the faith. <clears throat> whose power derived from Allah, the caliph, governed in accordance with Muslim law as defined by the Quran. Um, so, with, with Abu Bakr's efforts, the sacred text of Islam, the Quran, written in Arabic within 30 years of Muhammad's death, and Muslims believe that it contains the literal word of God, okay? Uh, the, so the Quran is the religious text of Muslims and of the religion Islam. 
much like the Bible and for the Christians in the in the uh, Torah for the uh, for for Judaism. Uh, the Islamic practices center on the five pillars of Islam. What are those? Faith, prayer, fasting, pilgrimage to Mecca. So you're going to so you travel to Mecca and alms or charities. It also includes several holidays and rituals as well. So once a year, Muslims from all over the world make a pilgrimage to Mecca, which today is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it is not expected that you do it every year, but it is, it is hoped that you can at least do it once in your lifetime. If you are a Muslim, it is expected or, you know, um, kind of, exp yes, try to do this if you can. Uh, make a pilgrimage to Mecca. This sacred act is called the Hajj, a pilgrimage to Mecca. Uh, this takes place in the last month of the year. Uh, every Muslim, again, is expected to make the journey at least once if they're able in their lifetime. Uh, during the Hajj, social status is forgotten. Uh, all pilgrims are expected to wear the same simple white clothing as you see here and perform the same acts of worship. Let's go ahead and watch a film here. Uh, please watch the film entitled The Islamic Pilgrimage to Mecca. Explain and then come on back. And let's go to another film here. Watch the next film entitled Pilgrimage, A 21st Century Journey. Kind of more of a modern day look at this and, and you know what this looks like. And then come on back. So the Kaaba. Uh, Muslim worshippers pray at the Kaaba. This is Islam's holiest shrine. You see it there in the middle, the black kind of rectangle. Uh, this is the this is at the Grand Mosque in Saudi Arabia's holy city of Mecca. June 23rd, during the last Friday of the holy month of Ramadan. According to Islamic tradition, the cube-shaped structure <clears throat> the, here, the, the black and gold, <clears throat> was originally built by Abraham <clears throat> and is considered by Muslims to be the house of God. <clears throat> so back to Abu Bakr. Bakr also created what is called the Caliphate. Caliphate is a territory under the leadership of an Islamic steward known as a Caliph. So a Caliphate, what is that? <clears throat> Office established in succession to the Prophet Muhammad to rule the Islamic Empire. Also, the name of that empire itself. Uh, a conflict broke out over who should be the successor of the third caliph. Uh, the third caliph was a man named Ali Uthman, uh, but he was assassinated. And the assassinate the assassins nominated uh, Ali, Muhammad's first cousin, as the next caliph. This started a civil war. Uh, so the promoters of Ali, who's Muhammad's you know blood relative, first cousin became known as Shiites. According to your book, what, who are they? Muslims belong to the branch of Islam, believing that God vests leadership of the community in a descendant of Muhammad's son-in-law, Ali. Uh, Shiism is, a, is the state religion of Iran today. Uh, the opponents in this civil war uh, were call, are called the Sunnis. Who are they? Muslims belong to the branch of Islam believing that the community should select its own leadership. The majority religion, it, it, it is the, the majority religion in most Islamic countries. So Sunnis is, is by far the, the uh, majority, uh, but the Shiites, of course, are, are still there and um, you know, loyal to, to, to their beliefs and their cause. Uh, so you have this, this, this breakup. You, know, you, you have, you have one, one side believing that that the leadership should come from a descendant of Muhammad through his son-in-law Ali, but that isn't in an effect a descendant of, of Muhammad himself. And then the Sunnis believe that that the community should select its own leadership that doesn't have to be blood. Okay. Uh, the final result from this disagreement resulted in the founding of the uh, uh, Umayyad Caliphate. Um, so what is the Umayyad Caliphate? Oops, sorry. According to your book, it was the first hereditary dynasty of Muslim caliphs, 661-750, uh, from their capital at Damascus, the Umayyads, ruled an empire that extended from Spain to India. They were eventually overthrown by the Abbasid Empire.
this created a new dynasty within the Islamic world, and it was a hereditary dynasty. A relation of Uthman became the caliph. Uh, so, of course, uh, what, what does this, you know, relate to us, or does it relate to us today? It, it does. All of this still relates to us today. Uh, Muslims uh, are a targeted portion of the population today in America. There's no question about it from racial profiling. Uh, and, you know, mostly white Americans, but not only white Americans, uh, assume that anybody that looks Middle Eastern is a terrorist. And this really started with 9-11. Uh, of course, you know, efforts towards mutual understanding are important when it comes to the future of the West and Islam and their relationships. You know, this, re this remains an issue and a problem. Um, and, you know, somehow you, if, if if you want to move forward in a positive you know, way, you've got to figure out a way to get past this. So the relevance of the lecture is there is tension between Islam and the Judeo-Christian West. They have had a challenging relationship for centuries. Today's conflicts in the Middle East are religiously charged. So it is important to know the facts and history. One more time. Relevance. There is tension between Islam and the Judeo-Christian West. They have had a challenging relationship for centuries. Today's conflicts in the Middle East are religiously charged. So it is important to know the facts in history. That's the end of that lecture, okay? But I just want to kind of reiterate on that. Uh, important to know the facts in history. First of all, the facts are the three religions, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, are very similar. I don't think that most people have any idea of that. Uh, so understanding that, that these people, whichever the three you're looking at, you really all want the same thing. So if three groups of people all want the same thing, you know, what are they arguing about? And this is the problem. You, know, you can't really come to the table and ever compromise or come to any conclusion. It seems to always get worse. Uh, I think if, if you looked at it from a point of view that, you know, we really are all the same, we, we might have a different kind of point of view or outlook about it, but let's change our, our approach from, from being different and competitive and, 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 you know, frightened of each other and realize that we really are kind of all looking for the same thing and kind of in the same group, okay? Okay, uh, let's move on here to the next section in our book. Is our chapter, I should say, The Rise and Fall of the Caliphate, 632-1258. Was the Baghdad Caliphate really the high point of Muslim civilization? So, you know, this, this, uh, this influence spread very quickly and really took over everything, uh, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, and as you see here, parts of Spain. Uh, and the um Umayyads uh, were the first Muslim dynasty. Um, the first rulers of the Islamic empire to pass down power within their family. And they shifted power to Damascus, the Umayyads capital city. Uh, so the extension of Islamic rule was based on an uncomplicated desire to spread the word of God. That's really what they want to do. Uh, but the Muslims used force when they met resistance and they did not compel their enemies to accept Islam. Uh, Muslims permitted Christians and Jews to practice their own faith. Uh, you could argue that the other two don't really do that. The, the, the other two want you to practice their faith. So uh, perhaps Christianity and Judaism can learn from Islam about how they do things. Uh, but secular concerns of the, of the Umayyads and problems that were inherent in, in the administration, you know, what had become a large empire, began to dominate the attention of the caliphs, often at the expense of religious concerns. So you, you, you fade away from the whole point, which was, which was religion, because you gotta, you got to manage your, your, uh, your, your caliphate. And it's large and complicated. Uh, okay, so the, of course, many devout Muslims had a problem with this, but also many of them, um, also, you know, faded away a little bit based on just how it, how large it had become. Uh, and I'm not saying that the religious values were ignored. On the contrary, they, they grew in strength for centuries, still growing. But they were not always at the forefront. 
uh, the caliph's role was supposed to be uh, the defender of the faith. Okay. Um, but it increasingly required him to devote attention to purely secular concerns, which dominate so much of, of every nation's history. Uh, so back to our decline. So, so the Umayyads decline. They had to adapt from desert living to ruling large cities. So again, you're not, you're no longer nomadic so much and, you know, living that way, but now you've got these large cities to, 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 uh, manage, uh, but also you've got a little bit of ethnocentrism going on here in, in that society. Ar Arabs were given more privileges than other people. That, of course, turns people away. Uh, there were problems between rich and poor. Same old story today, right? Uh, and in some cases, uh, the lavish lifestyle of the caliphs, uh, you know, taking up resources. So all this led to the decline of the uh, Umayyads, uh, and they were finally defeated by the Abbasid Caliphate. So who are they? Who are they? Uh, they are descendants of the Prophet Muhammad's uncle, Al Abbas. The Abbasids overthrew the Umayyad Caliphate and ruled an Islamic empire from their capital in Baghdad. Okay. Um, so the defeated. Umayyads escaped to Spain. The the Abbasids, the emphasized, de-emphasized ethnic Arabs, to create the Muslim Caliphate as a multi-ethnic entity. So I mentioned before that the uh, the Umayyads gave the Arabs special treatment, but the Abbasids take that away and make it make it you know more of a more uh, multi-ethnic uh, and and equality. They moved the capital from Damascus, what is now Syria, to Baghdad, present-day Iran. So Baghdad became the center of Islam, a glittering popular city in those days. Uh, Abbasid period is considered a golden age for Islam. Abbasid caliphs sponsored artists and scientists. Uh, so while Europe was languishing in what was once called its Dark Ages or Middle Ages, Thinkers in the Muslim world expanded upon the theories of Euclid and Ptolemy. They invented algebra. They even used hypodermic needles to remove cataracts from human eyes. So just to give you a kind of a comparison, while Europe's in a somewhat of a de-evolving doldrums, uh, the, the Muslim community was doing very well. Uh, of course, all, all those stories of the Arabian Nights are what we're talking about here from those days. The stories of the Arabian Nights, the, tale, the tales of Ali Baba, Sinbad the Sailor, uh, and Aladdin all came from the Abbasid era. Uh, but they were finally defeated by the Mongols. We haven't got to the Mongols yet, but you'll see that they pretty much defeated everybody. Uh, this led to their caliphate becoming fragmented, although the Ummah stayed unbroken, that community of, of uh, Muslims. Uh, the Europeans got involved here with what's, what were called the Crusades. We've talked about this before. These were military expeditions undertaken by the Christian nations of Europe to rega regain the Holy Lands of Palestine from the hands of the Muslims. Uh, the Europeans gained an obsession to gain the Holy Land back from the Muslims, back from the Muslims. But the Muslim response was, what? Uh, we we live here. This 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 is our. Um, oops, sorry. I'm screwing up here. There we go. Uh, we we live here. This this is our homeland. Uh, you know, who are you to say that that you're going to come and take it away from us? We live here. You're 1,500 miles away. You know what? You don't have any say here. Uh, so this so the result was the Crusades, and these were a series of battle between European Europeans and Muslims. Uh, so again, Jerusalem held a holy significance to Christians. There were eight in number. The first four crusades were called the principal crusades and the remaining four were called the minor crusades. Uh, let's take a break here and watch our another, another film. Please watch the crash course film about the crusades and then come on back. Okay. The efforts of the crusades, uh, 
on Europe of the Middle Ages. It's an important factor in the history of the progress of civilization. It also influenced the wealth and power of the Catholic Church. Also political matters, commerce, feudalism, intellectual development, uh, you know, all influenced by these, uh, I'm sorry, and influenced the voyages of exploration. So after 200 years of conflict and a vast expenditure of wealth and human lives, the Holy Land remained in Muslim hands, but 200 years of crusades uh, before it was finally ended and, and nothing had really changed. It was still in Muslim hands. Next section in your book is the Islamic civilization. How did the regional diversity affect the development of Islamic civilization? So as I said before, the, the community grew tremendously and had a huge influence in the Eastern Mediterranean as well as North Africa and Spain. Islamic culture was centered around the Sharia, okay? Sharia law or Islamic law. This is the religious legal system governing the members of the Islamic faith. Uh, it derived from the re religious precepts of Islam, including the Quran and the Hadith. Uh, the term Sharia comes from the Arabic language. According to your book, it is the body of moral and religious law derived from religious prophecy as opposed to human legislation. Okay. So I mentioned the word hadith in conjunction with the Sharia. So what is that? A tradition relating the words or deeds of the Prophet Muhammad next to the Quran, the most important basis for Islamic law. Okay, you have this very uh, uh, emotionally charged word, jihad, and fight for the cause of God, those who fight you, but do not be aggressive. Surely, does, surely God does not like the aggressors. So we talked about this briefly before. Uh, so the word jihad is mentioned many times in the, in the hadith. Uh, and it's perhaps the most misunderstood word, especially in the Western world. Let's watch a short film to find the truth about what a jihad is. Please watch the film, What Does Jihad Actually Mean? Okay, and then come on back. Okay, so what does it mean? In Islamic tradition, jihad, or the struggle in the way of God, whether as armed struggle or any form of opposition of the wrong, is generally regarded as one of the essential requirements of a person's faith as a Muslim. Opposition of the wrong. It could be an armed struggle, but doesn't always mean armed struggle. It doesn't always mean holy war, like many in the West have you know come to believe. But of course, this is criticized greatly in the Western world, without question. Uh, they call it discriminatory, even abusive, uh, regarding human rights, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion. Uh, that this is going against all of those. Those are, of course, tenets of, of American history. Uh, also accused of abuses towards women, uh, women who don't wear the hijab, the, the, the uh, face, facial coverings, and, and a headdress. Uh, if they don't wear that properly, some have had acid thrown in their face. Now, I'm not trying to suggest it happens to everybody, but it's happened more than once. Acid thrown in your face for simply not following the law. Uh, much of the writings of Islam have been accused of having a misogynistic overtone, hatred of women. Women are typically expected to stay in seclusion and be veiled in public in some cases, not, not, in every, not everywhere, but, but in some cases. Uh, women women uh, seldom travel and they're barred from public roles. Uh, Another Arabic word is the madrasa, a learning institution. So the madrasa represents any public, private, secular, and religious learning institution, including a school and a university for, for Muslim or non-Muslim learners. In the 12th and 13th centuries, there was a rise of a brotherhood called the Sufis, Sufism. This is a Muslim movement whose followers seek to find divine truth and love through direct encounters with God. This arose from within Islam in the 8th and 9th centuries. Uh, Sufis took vows of poverty and celibacy. They, they demanded a strict self-control. Uh, 
that would hopefully uh, enable both psychological and mystical insights as well as a loss of self. Uh, the ultimate goal was a mystical union with God. So Sufis engage in a variety of ritual practices intended to help them realize union with God. So it is estimated that by the year 2050, the number of Muslims will nearly equal the number of Christians around the world and put, become the most popular religion in the world. What is the cause of this? It's driven primarily by differences in fertility rates and the size of youth populations among the world's major religions, as well as by people switching faiths. Okay, so fertility rates, youth populations, uh, numbers of childbirths, and so on. People switching faiths. Uh, the numbers are rising. Uh, so perhaps as a sign of all these changes, most experts today agree that Islam is growing faster than any of the other faiths. Okay, that is the end of chapter 9. Thank you.